Amen. Well, good morning, church. I hope you're doing well today. If you don't know me, uh, my name's Billy. I get the privilege to serve here as one of the pastors. It's a huge honor for me uh, to serve you in that way. I missed you guys last week. I was up at our location in Athens, and we were introducing uh, Jamie, as you guys heard about on the video, as our new church planner. Uh, and he will be going up to Oconee County, which is right outside of Athens. Uh, actually, uh, it's kind of crazy. We uh, there's, there's so many, you forget how many people are in Athens until you get up there, and so, especially with the college being there, uh, but, you know, in that area, there's, I mean, where we'll be planning, there's, I think, 250,000 people just right there at his uh, influence, and, and then I come home Monday, and, of course, the news broke at, in Barrow County of the school shooting, and it just kind of reaffirmed the need for the hope of Christ in that area, so uh, we're excited about that, um, obviously praying for them. And uh, man, just looking forward to seeing what God's going to do uh, there as well. So if you got your Bible, I'm also excited about jumping back into the book of Romans. Uh, so if you're new, uh, we have been walking through the book of Romans pretty much the entire year. Uh, we've taken a couple breaks to do some mini-series in between those, but uh, we're going to finish out the book of Romans here in the next couple of months. And so we've made it all the way to chapter 12, chapter 12. And so that's where we'll start today. I want to start in verse 1. I know Blake preached that last week, but it kind of, really verses 1 and 2 are necessary uh, on the front end of pretty much every teaching on the back half of Romans uh, chapter 12, because really they are the preface for everything that Paul wants to instruct us to do uh, in Romans chapter 12 through 16. So let me read for us, and uh, we'll jump right in. Paul says, Therefore... I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your true and your proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing and his perfect will. And so Paul starts this chapter really with this idea of therefore. Anytime you see therefore in the Bible, it should kind of clue you in that you need to know what happened before that because he's kind of building off of that. And so, and then he kind of gives us a description in really three words of all that we've studied in Romans chapter one all the way through 11. And he summarizes all of that teaching with God's mercy. God's mercy, and so I want to just review uh, that with you. You know, you remember back all the way in the beginning of Romans, we learned uh, that no one is righteous, not even one, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark, the standard that God requires to be saved, which is righteousness, and we've all missed that, and Paul's taught us that we, not only that, but we've defamed the glory of God. We didn't want to live the way that he wanted us to live, which was to glorify him. We wanted to do what we wanted to do. And so because of that, uh, we have been separated from God and with no point of return. There's nothing we could do. We couldn't go to church enough. We couldn't read the Bible enough, do enough good works, stack up enough good ships over bad ships to do it. Uh, none of that would work because the, the, the only thing that would satisfy God's standard is righteousness. But then we saw in the end of chapter 3 that God has now provided righteousness for us in the person of Jesus Christ. And so Christ came. He lived the perfect life. He died the death that you and I deserted to die because of our sin. And so basically he put himself in our place. And then now he told us if we put all of our faith in Christ, not faith and work, but just faith in Christ, believe that Christ has done everything necessary to save us, that he did live the perfect life, that he did die on the cross, and he did that on our behalf, now we could be and receive the righteousness of God, which in, in hence would justify us before God. And now we can be back in a right relationship with God where God designed us to be. And so that is what Romans really 1 uh, through 5 taught us. And then he kind of went forward and he got really excited about this life now that we get to live, not only does we get justified before God, but then God gives us the Spirit, His Son, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? They're all God, three persons, and, and now we get the Spirit of God to live inside of us to do this work called sanctification inside of us. So 
when he justifies us, we are righteous before the eyes of God, positionally, but you and I both know practically, we still got some things that need to work out in us, right? We got some, some, some flaws. We got some ways of thinking that are not honoring to God. We have some uh, sins in our life that need to be dealt with. And so God commits to us and says, hey, I'm gonna go ahead and give you the righteousness in Christ, and now I'm gonna put my spirit in you, which is gonna work through you to grow you to be more and more like Christ for the rest of your life. And so Paul just gets really geeked up about this, and he starts talking about uh, this, this war between uh, the, the spirit of God in our life and the flesh in our life and how we're now dead to sin, so we have power over it. We don't have to live in sin anymore. We have the power now to say no to sin and yes to Christ. And then he just starts talking about in Romans 8, and he says, and because the spirit of God's in us and we didn't do anything to get it, we can't do anything to lose it, so now God has committed himself to us for the rest of our life, and because of that, we can be assured that one day God's gonna glorify us and take us to heaven the way he's promised to do it. And that is the good news of the gospel. And Paul comes back off of that and he said, let me just sum that up for you. That's just God's mercy. That's just how good he is. That's his grace and that's his mercy. So now, in light of that mercy, Paul wants to give us some instruction about how we should live our life. He says, now in view of that mercy, last week, as you guys learned, we need to live a life of worship. We need to, to sacrifice things in our life. We need to surrender our life to Christ and live in response to what he's done for us, the posture of surrender and, and, and to, to honestly put ourselves on the altar, so to speak, and leave it there, that everything we do, everything that we, uh, has one aim, and that's to glorify God. He says that we should be transformed. We should live a transformed life, that the fact of, that Christ has done for us, every, all the mercy that he's shown us, should change us. The word of God should now renew our mind. We should think differently, act differently, talk differently. All of those things should be different in our life because of the mercy of God that we have experienced. And then at the end, he says that we should know the will of God and we should walk in the will of God. Like one of the greatest things about being saved is now you can know the will of God for your life. And not only the will of God, the perfect, pleasing will of God. I mean, that's a beautiful, beautiful scripture when you think about uh, the perfect, good, pleasing will of God. I mean, that, that's something that we should desire to walk in, and that's what Paul wants us to do. So now he's about to instruct us on kind of the first instruction of what that looks like to live out this renewed mind, this transformed life, this life of worship. And he starts that in verse three, and he says this, for by, grace, for by the grace given me, this is Paul talking, I say to every one of you, so now he's talking to the church as kind of Pastor Paul, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. All right, so he comes out a little hot there. So he comes straight after pride. He's basically saying, hey, you guys think a lot of yourself. You shouldn't think a lot of yourself. Then he goes on. But rather, think of yourself with sober judgment. What does that mean? Well, that means that we think of ourselves rightly. In the eyes of God, we think about ourselves the same way God thinks about us, which is not more highly than we should think, but it's also not less than we should think. There's a middle ground there that Paul wants us to live in. He says, in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you, meaning when we, uh, God gives us this gift of faith to believe in Christ, we all get this, this, uh, this now the ability to see things the way that we should see them. That comes with the faith. We, when God gives us faith, we become a Christian and when we become a Christian, we get the Spirit of God, and now we can begin to see things in the world and us and God the way that we are supposed to. Verse four, for just as each of us has one body with many members, these members do not all have the same function. So now in Christ, we, talking to the church, though many, a lot of us, we form one body. And now each member belongs to all the others. Like we're now binded together. We're, we're family together in Christ. And he says, uh, so in Christ, no one form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts. So not all of us have the same gifts. According to the grace given to each of us, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. 
If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, then we should show mercy cheerfully. So Paul really kind of begins to point out the first things he wants to talk to us about are really our pride, because just make this connection. If the church is a body of Christ and we all have to work together, every member has different gifts and body parts, and just like your body, we all, they all have to work together to accomplish the right function for what God intended them to do. The same thing, but here's the deal. If we think more highly of ourselves than we ought to, then we think we don't need each other. That makes sense? And so he starts there, and he says, first, we need to be humble and understand that we need others. We need the church. We need other people in our life to accomplish the purpose for which God has for us. And then he gives us his design for the church, and then he gives us, hey, and you've been gifted with a part to play in that. So here's how I'm gonna break that down if you wanna write these down. Paul points out three ways that the gospel renews our minds and transforms our life. The first is it gives us a right view of ourselves, a right view of ourselves. So let's talk about that. Verse three, again, he says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to you. So the first thing I want you to write down is this. Letter A, the gospel kills our pride. The gospel destroys pride in our lives. Paul knows that there is a tendency within all men and all women to think more highly of ourselves than we should. Not in a self-worth way, not meaning that you're not worth anything. God gives you that worth uh, early on. But this is talking more in a self-importance way. We all think we're more important than we are. And that just comes naturally to all of us, including myself. We all think in more of a self-consumed way. Like that comes natural to us. We think about what we think about and we see it through the lens of our lives more than we see it through any other lens. And Paul's saying we all do that. John MacArthur, a pastor out in California, says it this way. There is nothing that is more natural to fallen human beings, that's folks before they are Christians, than pride. Because pride, frankly, is the defining sin of fallenness. He says, pride is rooted in self-idolatry. It is to posture ourselves in competition with God rather than submitting our life to God. So you can see how pride would affect us from laying our lives down in worship because we don't want to lay our life down before God. We want to be God, right? And so we wanna do that, and that's what... It hinders, and so John Piper says it this way, pride is the presumption that we can be happy without God. And we see this all throughout the Bible. It's not just us. I could show you from Genesis to Revelation how this sin of pride is really the root of all pride. You know, one author said pride is the granddaddy of all sin, meaning everything comes out of that pride in us. At its root, pride results in us thinking that we would be a better God than God himself. And we see that in the story of Adam and Eve early on in the Bible when they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the one tree that God told them that they couldn't eat from. And it wasn't just about the fruit. It wasn't just that the apple looked good and they were hungry. What that decision was was a decision to reject God, a decision and a belief that their lives would be better off if they were in control of them, if they were on the throne of their lives. And it's important, it's important to us that we understand the same sin that was in Adam and Eve is really the root sin that's inside of each of us because they uh, are our great, 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 great grandparents. And because we've been born from them, that sin has been inherited into our lives. And so it's important that we don't just flash by that and say, well, Billy, that's right. You know, I know I struggle with pride. I actually want you to think about this, like think into it so that you can actually see the results of it in your life because it is important that we're able to discern what is pride in us and what is of God. We need to realize that there's a foundational problem within all of humanity and it is the sin of pride. And sometimes, you know, pride looks good and it feels good to us. Like I'm, I'm not saying that that doesn't happen in all of our lives. Sometimes That's the hardest thing about the sin of pride is it feels natural. Like to want to do what you want to do and for you to decide what's good and evil and to see things through your opinion and nobody else's, that feels good sometimes, doesn't it? Well, we can be honest. I mean, I know you are at church, but we can be honest here. 
We like to see things through our lens and we like to see them that way. But here's the idea, just because something looks good and feels good doesn't mean it's always good. And the sin of pride, without a doubt, will always end in destruction. It will end in destruction for you, for people around you, for our church, all of the above. So that's what pride does. It comes before the fall. That's what Proverbs teaches. And so pride comes natural to us, and that's why it's the most deceiving of all sins, I would say. We naturally think very highly of ourselves. We naturally think that our opinions are the best opinions. We naturally think that our ways are the right ways. And if anybody thinks or does anything different, they're wrong and not us. Have, can we be honest? Have we noticed that about ourselves? So most of us, when we take a trip to Europe and they're driving on the other side of the road, our first thought is not like, oh, it's kind of cool they drive on the other side of the road. What do we say? Why are y'all driving on the wrong side of the road? Why do y'all eat this type of food? And we have this, this limited view of, of what we are because we see everything through our own lens. It's not that they're driving on the wrong side of the road. They're just driving on the different side of the road than you drive, right? So it's, it's beginning to understand and see those things in your life. And so that's exactly how pride works, is it controls our minds. It makes us feel superior to others. And it leads us into insubordination before God. Because pride rejects authority, that's what it does. It rejects God, it rejects his ways. C.S. Lewis, a great author, uh, says it this way, pride is like spiritual cancer, eating away at everything God is trying to do in our lives and through our lives. And this is why the Bible says God hates pride. He hates arrogance. We see this throughout the Bible. Proverbs 8, 13, Isaiah 23, 9, Proverbs 16, 5, Daniel 4, 29 through 37, James 4, 6, 1 Peter 5, from beginning to end, over and over the scripture says that God despises pride. He despises uh, people who look upon themselves higher than they should. Paul describes it really well in Romans 8, 7. A couple weeks ago, we read this. He says, the mind that is set on the flesh, and remember, that is the natural mind apart from God's transforming spirit. He says, that mind of the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. You see, our old mind before Christ, if we're a Christian, likes to do things our way. And so we submit to our own law, not the law of God. And when God tries to tell us to do something a certain way that we don't want to do it, we reject it and do what we want to do. That's the sin of pride. That's what's in each of us. And if you hadn't felt that, then you have not been honest with yourself about how you actually feel about God, which is a whole other issue of justification. And we could talk about that as well, but I'll spare you of that. Hopefully you'll be honest and, and see it there. So here Paul says that's exactly where the gospel wants to start its work in our lives. It wants to renew our mind. It wants to humble us into a joyful and logical or proper posture of surrender to God. He says it this way. This is how it works. When we receive God's mercy, we, our proper response is to surrender our lives, is to lay our lives down. And he says this is our act of worship. And as our minds are being renewed by this gospel, humility begins to characterize our lives. So I want you to write this down. The gospel humbles us before it heals us. The gospel will always humble us before it will heal us. You see, the gospel, the gospel humbles us because it reveals our sin. It shows us that we've rejected the God of the universe who has a good, perfect plan for our life and we've went our own way. But instead of punishing us and condemning us, God in his grace and his love and his mercy punished his own son in our place. And now instead of being mad at us, he's invited us into a relationship. Now through faith, we can be restored back into right relationship with God. We can be reconciled back into a relationship with him. And we can live the life that he created us to live with him, for him, for his glory in the beginning. And it has nothing to do with anything that you and I can do or that we bring to the table. It's all a gift of his grace and his mercy toward us, which is why Paul says in Ephesians 2 that now 
Our whole boast in everything should be in Christ because he's given us everything. We've done nothing. We brought nothing to the table, which is why we should not think more highly than ourselves in ourselves than we ought to think is what he's saying. So now everything once we once rejected because of this grace and this attitude of worship, namely God's will for our life that we've rejected, his good, pleasing and perfect will for our life. Now when our minds are renewed, we start to delight in it. Cuz we see it as good and perfect and pleasing. And when we begin to see that, this is how our mindset changes. This is what the gospel does is it renews our mind. It transforms our mind to now believe that God's plan for our life, his good, perfect, and pleasing plan for our life is the best plan for our life, even better than what we think the plan of our life is. And it reestablishes what we see as good and it aligns us to what God sees as good. So now we delight in walking in the will of God. We get to walk in the will of God. We get to experience abundant life in Christ. And Paul says, because of that mercy, we don't think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. You see, it's impossible to have a high view of God and his grace and his mercy and an overinflated view of ourselves at the same time. We can't think highly of ourselves and highly of God at the same time. It doesn't work that way. God's grace produces humility in our lives, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Because listen to me, humble people are usable people in the eyes of God. If you want to be used by God greatly, it will start with humility. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 2, one of my life verses. The one to whom God will look is the humble, the contrite in spirit, and those who tremble at his word. That's what God's looking for. You want to know the type of people that he's looking for? He's looking for humble people that listen to his word and do what he asks them to do. But that's not all that God's grace does. Paul goes on and he says it, it doesn't just correct us uh, and, and show us how, how highly we think of ourselves. It actually uh, gives us a new identity. It, it lifts us up. It lifts us up out of despair that we're not good enough or that we're, uh, we're, we think too highly of ourselves. And now he says, but listen, I got a purpose for your life, a plan for your life which is letter B, the gospel gives us a new identity, and that new identity is servant of God. Notice the back half of verse three. It says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather, contrast, think of yourself with sober judgment. Sober would be a word we think with drinking, but it's kind of the same idea. When we're drinking, our judgment is impaired. We don't see things the way they should be, or they don't come through that way. So to be sober in our judgment is to think rightly or correctly or to actually see things for the way that they are meant to be seen in the eyes of God. And he says we can do this because of the faith that God has distributed to us in salvation. And so we've got to understand this too, that God has given us this faith as a gift and it not only saves us, but it also accurately allows us to see God for who he is and to see ourselves for who God sees us as. Does that make sense? All of that is the gift of faith. And so faith doesn't just get you out of hell and get you into heaven. Faith transforms your life because it opens your eyes to see things the way that God sees them. And now we can align our lives to the way that God designed for them to be. So Paul goes on to explain that. God has saved us into a family and gifted us to be a part of his church. We get to now be a part of his family business. Essentially, the gospel humbles us, but it also gives us a new identity, servant. So the gospel is not just interested in humbling us, but it also is interested in picking us up out of despair and showing us that we have a God-given purpose. It shows us that we weren't created to live just for ourselves. It shows us that this world is not about us, it, that we're created to serve God, and that our greatest joy and fulfillment and purpose is found in faithfully walking with God and in his purposes. That's what it does. And that, my friends, is an absolute game-changing thing in your life. Like, it is unbelievable. I remember when this truth began to be true to me when I became a Christian. And you talk about a life-transforming thing. Like, when you begin to see that God's plan for your life is better than any other plan, like, it changes things. Like it changes everything about your life. 
Think about this. What if every day you woke up and reminded yourself of that truth, that your primary identity in this life on this day is to be a servant of God? Like, that's it. Like, God, what, what am I doing today? I just wanna be a servant of you. God, I just wanna serve you. God, I just wanna serve you. Could you imagine how clarifying that would be in your marriage? How clarifying that would be in your parenting? How clarifying that would be at your workplace? How clarifying that would be on the team that you play on? How clarifying that would be in the community as you do what you do in the community? I mean, isn't this how the disciples identified themselves? I mean, you only have to read a couple of books in the New Testament to see that pretty much every one of them starts with Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. James, a servant of Christ Jesus. Jude, a servant of Christ Jesus. Peter, a servant of Christ Jesus. I mean, it's, it's, they embrace this as their identity. So let's just go there for a minute and believe that our assignment from God today and every day of our life is to be a servant. Like, think about that. Think if, if your name is in the room is Chris. My name is Chris, and I'm a servant of God. Just like, just like they wrote the Bible. If you're in the room, your name's Allison. My name's Allison. I'm a servant of God. God's gifted me with gifts to serve him. My life is his. I want to live for him. My name's Billy, and I've been given an identity. I've been given a purpose, and I've been given that by God himself. The God that created the universe has spoken identity and purpose into my life. Can you just sit in that for a minute? Who else's opinion matters? Like just allow that to fill your heart and your mind. Such a beautiful, beautiful thing. If that doesn't fire you up, then I don't really know what else to tell you. But think about the clarity that that brings into our life because that's really what identity and purpose does is it brings a tremendous clarity into our life. So much of our life falls into place when we embrace our identity that God has given us. Just think about it. You know the best way to fight the sin of pride in your life? Serve. You know the secret to experiencing abundant life in Christ? Living as a servant of Christ Jesus. You know how to be great in the kingdom of God? Serve. It's, it's really as simple as it sounds. Follow in Christ's example. Stop living for yourself. Lay your life down for God and for the sake of others. And here's the crazy thing about the teaching of Christ. He literally says, when we lay our life down for the sake of others and for him, we actually find life for the first time. Can you imagine that? That abundant life that you've been looking for, trying to do everything for yourself and trying to do everything that you wanna do. And Jesus says, you're thinking about it wrongly. Life is not found in the abundance of possessions. Life is not found in money and sex and power or whatever you're pursuing. Life is found in following Jesus. It's what you're created for. You can't fill a hole in your heart that was created to only be filled with Jesus with something else. So first, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. In faith, think of ourselves as a servant Believe what God says about us. Secondly, Paul wants us to have the right view of God's church. So not just the right view of ourselves, but the right view of God's church. Listen to verse four. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace that has been given to each of us. Literally, the Bible calls the church the body of Christ. I like, just think about that. Like, I mean, that's like we are part of Christ. Like, in God's eyes, He sees us in Christ, like His body. He's the head, we're the body. Body parts, all of that. Think of a human body, and that's what God wants in your mind. Meaning, Christ is the head, He controls the body, the brain controls everything. We serve and work together and play our part as a different body part. 
and God is glorified. Like that's simple, almost so simple a kid can understand that. But we, we get so far away from that in the church. Like this is how God designed the church to work. This is his design. As Blake said last week, Paul wants us to understand that we weren't just saved from something. Like God didn't just save us from hell. That's a great reason to be saved, but that's, that's the basic thing that he saved us from. He saved us into his family. He saved us to be a part of his body, to be a part of the instrument that he wants to use to glorify himself into the world. It's an incredible, incredible thing when we understand that we're saved into the family of God. And it's an eternal family. It'll never go away. We get to spend eternity together. No more death. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, I love how Peter says it. He says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of God who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Like, let that sink in. God didn't just pick you because you were there. Like, he wasn't just looking and thinking, man, there's nobody left. Billy's average, I guess, I guess I'll take him. Like, God chose you and chose me. Like, when he thought about his family, he wanted us in the family of God. And then he did everything possible to bring us into it. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. We are God's chosen people. We're his family. He's adopted us out of darkness and into light. He saved us on purpose to work together for his purposes. And his purpose is to use us collectively, together, as a church family, as a team, to declare his praises and reveal his glory to the world. I don't care how many good teams you've coached or played on, you will never be on a better team than Team Jesus. Ever. Ever. Like, it is an eternal team, and it is an incredible, incredible thing. It's powered by God himself. Not even Alabama is that. So in order to really process this, I just really need you to see and process through a few things. Think deeper into a couple things. The first is this, letter A. God's design for the church is perfect and beautiful. It's perfect and beautiful. So the bad experiences that most of us have had with church, like I, I don't know, I wish I could sit down with every person and say, when you think of the church, what comes into your mind? But I could promise you 80% would be bad and about 20% would be good. And I'm hoping the 20% is like, man, we've had a great experience at Connection. But at some point, the 20% will turn into, well, there's this person at Connection. And here's what they did to me. I can't believe they'd do something like that. They call themselves a Christian. But at some point, what you have to realize is that the problem with the church is not God's design. The problem are the sinful people that are at work in the church. And nowhere you go are you gonna find anything different. And so what that means is in our minds, we have to understand that God's design for the church is perfect and beautiful, so it's worth us pursuing, but also understand that along the way, we're probably going to be sinned against. And some things are probably going to happen to us that hurt us. But that's not on God. That's on the sinful brother and sister that you're doing life with in there. And then you gotta realize that God's actually designed the family of God to be a place of sanctification where we can learn how to love and forgive each other, where we can learn how to walk side by side and not agree on things, where we can learn how to allow our love for God and his word and his purposes to transcend any hurt personally. And that's hard but it's God's design. And that's what we have to begin to see. Because you know, to the sinful mind, God's design doesn't seem beautiful and perfect. 
to the person who's been, their mind has been formed by the individualistic society that we live in, God's design for the church doesn't seem good because it's about Christ and not about them. To the person who's consumed with themselves and their self-seeking, they're not going to like God's design for the church. Because God is not obsessed with you. He's obsessed with making much of Christ and he's designed you to play into that purpose. And it just so happens that that's the greatest thing that he could do out of love for you. And he's created it that way so that when we're glorifying Christ in our lives and we're functioning within the context of the local church, we're flourishing. And a good father wants that for us. And that's what God's design for the church does. But to the one who has the mind of Christ and who's committed to love God and to love others and to accomplish his mission, the, God's design for the church is perfect and beautiful. It's beautiful because it's the community and family that you've always wanted. Like God literally gives you a group of people that at the deepest level want the same things that you want. You know, and, and I mean, there was a time where a lot of people in my family were not Christians. And I remember when I got saved and I was wanting to live for God and they didn't really care about that. And, and when I got saved, God threw me into a group of men that loved God and that wanted to pursue him and be holy and live on mission and see other people come to Christ. And I mean, that to me was like a, like a safeguard that I knew I had a place to go for people to help me, for people to pray for me, to love on me. That's what the church is designed to be, not an event that you come to on Sundays, but a family that you belong to. That's why you'll always hear me say, I would rather you go to a connect group every week and come on Sunday once a month because there's gonna, this is too big. You're never gonna be able to know people in this room. You're never gonna be known in this room. But where the church becomes the church is when it becomes a family. It doesn't mean this, this isn't great. I mean, it's awesome. I mean, this many people wanting to hear the word of God, worshiping together, there's power in that. Don't hear me saying that. We need to gather why we do it but you need the church to be more than that in your life and God's designed it to be more than that he's designed it to be a family that you belong to to be a group of people working together it binds you together with a group of diverse people and makes them your family and there's nothing better for your life than for you to get out of your little comfort zone where all of your friends talk about the same things over and over again it's cool to y'all, but it's stupid to everybody else. <laughs> and throw into an environment where you get to meet some people who grew up a little bit different than you did. You get to meet some people who maybe didn't have a mom, maybe didn't have a dad. You get to meet some people who grew up thinking that God didn't exist. You get to meet some people who grew up thinking that you had to work for your salvation. That nothing you ever did was good enough and you could never know if you've done enough to appease God. You get to hear their stories. You get to meet people who grew up with a lot and people who didn't grow up with very much. And you're not bound together by your experience. You're bound together by the transcendent fact that you love God and that you're committed to be a family together and to help each other live out this life that God has designed for you to live out, these purposes that he's put. This is the church. That's what the church is. And so part of it is uncomfortable to step into, but it's the greatest step that we could ever take to be a part of his body. It's both beautiful and it is perfect. And Paul says in Ephesians 3, it is exactly how the manifold wisdom of God is gonna be shown to the world. There's nothing like God's church in a selfish and broken world where everyone is out for themselves, to live for themselves, to get theirs. The church is God's way of shining the bright light in the darkness. It's a beacon of hope, a pillar of truth, an outpost of heaven on earth. 
a tangible display of the heart of God, a vehicle to accomplish the mission of God. And because of that, it's both perfect and beautiful. And I can tell you this from experience, it's absolutely amazing to watch God use the church. I've been in ministry for 15 years. I've seen God save all types of people. I've seen small churches, I've seen big churches. But there's something about the Spirit of God at work in the body of Christ that has an ability to do some incredible, incredible things. I love how Acts 2 says that they were devoted to God, they had all things in common, and the power of God was at work within them. And because of that, the Lord just kept adding to their number day by day. There's nothing better to do with our time than invest in God's church. Letter B, isolation is not God's will for your life. We gotta understand this. If we don't understand this, we'll never understand the importance of God's church. Isolation is not God's will for your church. I'm gonna bounce back up to verse two where he talks about his will being good and perfect and pleasing. We have to remember that. And God's will for your life is for you to be a part of a family, for you to be a participant in his church, for you to go all in with him and all in with his church. That's God's will for your life. And we all need the family of God, and we need the family of God for so many different reasons. We need him to know God deeper. We need him to be encouraged. We need the family of God to be discipled into maturity. We need the family of God to experience God's love in a tangible way. We need the family of God for accountability. Listen, if you haven't ran away from God yet as a Christian, you will, trust me. And when you do, you need people in your life that know where you're running so that they can go get you and say it ain't worth it. Whatever lie you're believing is not worth it and I love you too much to let you go. And if you don't have that, that is a great indicator that you have not become a part of this church family. And I know some of you are like, listen, I don't need nobody in my business like that. But I'm telling you, because I love you, you need at least one, you don't have to tell everybody but at least one person that loves God needs to know what's going on in your heart and in your mind. And they need to be able to see what lie that you may believe so that when you run off with that boy or you run, after, run off after that substance, whatever it is that floats your boat, they know exactly where you're going. And when you open that door, they're gonna be standing there because they love you and they love God and they desire the same thing that God desires for your life. And if you don't have that, you do not have the church. And you are missing out on the gift that God has given you. Don't miss out on that gift. Scripture's clear, God is committed to his church. Committed to his church. It is his plan A. He doesn't have a backup plan. Like he's not working some side game. Like, it ain't like, oh, look at these people. They're doing some cool stuff in the church. That's awesome. They think they're growing. Wait till I bring the white horse in from the side. Like, that's not what he's doing. Like, he's promised, Matthew 16, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not stand against it. When he comes back on the white horse, guess who he's coming back for? The church. He's coming to get us. He's committed to his church. The question is, are you committed to his plan? Are you committed to his church? Are you heart and soul? Because listen to me, isolation in our lives, it may seem easy to deal with things by yourself, and you may think it's protecting you and your reputation, but I can promise you it is leading to destruction. From a spiritual standpoint, isolation is spiritual suicide. And it's all throughout the scriptures, all throughout the scriptures. You, you were not created to do life alone. God himself was created. He, he exists in community. If God himself needs Father, Son, Holy Spirit, do you think you're better than him? You have to have it. Isolation will lead you to some bad places. Lastly, let her see God can do more through us than he can do through you. So individually, I just wanna give you the stats of the greatest person to ever walk the face of the earth for Christianity. That would be Jesus. 33 years, he made 12 disciples, saw about 500 people come to faith in Christ. 
true faith in Christ. You'd say, Billy, how in the world do you know that? I could explain it later. But when he comes back after he got crucified, 500 people showed up in Corinthians is what Paul said. If you didn't show up on that day, I'm gonna just go out on a limb and say you weren't a believer. Because if Jesus would have rose from the dead, you would have been there. I hope so. If you wouldn't, we need to talk some questions. So 33 years, 15, 12 disciples, one of them fell away, so 11 disciples, 500 converts. That's 15, year, 15 salvations a year that Jesus saw. And that's one disciple about every three years that he had the opportunity to disciple. That's not bad. That's great. He's a superstar. He's the best to ever live. And then Acts 2 happens. So Jesus dies. He resurrects. He comes and appears to the 500. He goes back. Acts 2, he sends the Spirit of God to be in the 12 disciples that he had made. They stand up, preach the gospel. And one day, one day, not 33 years, one day, 3,000 people saved. Over the next 30 years, there would be more than 10,000 Christians by the end of the book of Acts. 300 years after the book of Acts, millions of Christians all over the Roman Empire. Today, over 2 billion Christians because of what God can do through us and not me. We're better together. Jesus knew that. I mean, he said it himself. Do you know what he, he said in, 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 in uh, what is it, John 14, where he said, he who believes in me, the works that I will do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. I've seen this in the life of our church. Like, there's no way you could accomplish what we are accomplishing together. No way. It's God's plan. He can accomplish more through us than he can through you. And because of that, it makes the church worth, worth fighting for. The last truth I think Paul points out to us is the right view of our role in ministry. So not just a right view of ourselves, not just a right view of his church, but also the right view of our role in ministry. He starts going through these different gifts and he talks about a bunch of different ones. He says, you know, uh, God's given us different gifts according to the grace in which he's given us some prophecy, some serving, some teaching, some encouraging, some giving, some leading, some showing mercy. And I don't know exactly how much you know about spiritual gifts, but for Paul to talk about them right after he talks about Romans 12 is a big deal. And so if it was a big deal to Paul in the Bible, it should be a big deal to us. Because spiritual gifts are usually, are, are, in reality, God's divine way of working through ordinary people like us through the power of the Holy Spirit to encourage the faith of other believers. And so if we wanna be used by God, we have to understand God's purpose for spiritual gifts. The Bible teaches us that when we get saved, we receive the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God empowers every believer with spiritual gifts. Nobody got left out. There are no sideline Christians in the kingdom of God. And then Paul teaches us here that we've all been entrusted with spiritual gifts by God to build up the body of Christ. And spiritual gifts, he says, are gifts of grace. They're gifts from God to us, meaning we don't earn them, we don't get to choose them. He does, and he gives them to us freely. And he says there are different kinds of spiritual gifts. Some of them are natural abilities that he just kind of uses. Other of those are supernatural abilities that he puts in us. Some gifts come temporarily and others stay with us permanently. I mean, there's all kinds of things. There's four lists of New Test in the New Testament of spiritual gifts, and I don't have time to take you through each of them, but I have a, uh, if you're interested in knowing more about each individual gift, I have a sheet of paper out at the blue tent that you are welcome to grab and take home uh, with you. If they run out, just ask them and they can text you a digital copy. Some of the gifts are a little more complex than others, but some are just simple things that God does in us and through us. And you say, well, Billy, how do I know what my gift is? Well, I would just encourage you with one simple thing. Listen, so many people get so caught up in all the different gifts and how you know if you have this gift, how you know if you have that gift. The purpose of every spiritual gift that God gives is to build up the faith of another person. All right, so here's my spiritual gift plan for idiots because obviously that's how I think. 
just focus on building up the faith of other people. Get into a small group, surround yourself with people that love God, and make it your aim and your intention to allow God to use you to encourage their faith. And as you do that, your gift will rise to the top. They'll see it, it'll be effective, and they'll be like, man, when you talk about Christ, when you teach what you're learning in the Bible, it's amazing. When you pray for me, things happen. And they'll just start raising to the surface. But listen, it starts with you engaging in the church and saying, man, I wanna be a part of a small group. I wanna commit my life to helping other people grow in their relationship with God. And if you do that, I promise you, and you begin to faithfully try to build up the faith of other people, God will let you know what your spiritual gift is. Right where you are, I want you to bow your head. I don't know what your view of the church was as you came in this morning. I don't know if you've ever even thought about God's design for the church, but I pray this morning that maybe God has been illuminating some things in your life. Maybe for you, it's the pride issue. I say maybe for you, maybe for all of us, it's the pride issue. Areas of our life where we think we know better than God. Maybe one of them is, I don't need the church. I'll just do it on my own. I've always done it on my own. Why would I change that now? Well, the reason you change it is because God's saying you need to change it. But whatever it is, whatever area of your life that God's speaking into, would you have the courage to step this morning and say, God, I'm in. I believe your will is good and perfect and pleasing, and I wanna walk in it. And if you believe that, your mind will become feet. And would you tell somebody, that's what the church is for, so that they can walk with you and hold you accountable and pray for you and encourage you. You need that. So maybe your next step today is to join a small group. Maybe your next step today is to begin to take the church seriously and not just come to church, but become part of the church. And maybe for some of us in the room, our next step is to be saved. Maybe we don't have a relationship with God. The last thing you need to be worried about is spiritual gifts if you don't have a relationship with God. And if you're in the room today and you say, Billy, that's me. I, I don't have a relationship with God and I want that. We have a prayer team that would love to talk with you more about that and get you some resources to help you and walk beside you. And if that's you, I'm gonna ask you to be bold. I want you right where you are to just lift your hand in the air and say, Billy, that's me this morning. I want a relationship with God. I don't have one and I want one. And anybody in this room, you raise your hand high where I can see you. So Father, here's our prayer for this morning. God, would you humble us? God, would you teach us to walk in this mindset, this attitude of a servant? And God, would you help us value your church the way that you value it? so that you can accomplish more in us and through us for your glory into the world. And God, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We'll see you guys back next week.